Our next speaker is an expert in cognitive psychology and, of course, AI. He's written five books. The coolest of them, the most popular of them, is called Guitar Zero. It's an account of him as an adult trying to learn how to play the guitar, but it's a lot more than that. In the book, he, during his journey, talks about what's going on in his brain. And what makes it cool to me is that he takes this really complicated subject and brings it down to earth. Well, a little bit. <laughs> so please, my friends, give a very warm Starmus Earth welcome to Gary Marcus. So there's a question I think about every day, which is, is AI on balance going to be good for society or bad for society? And I'm going to ask today, what kind of AI should we want? And I'll start by saying that we should want one that is consistent with human rights and human dignity. And that idea is not new, new to me by any stretch. UNESCO, for example, laid out its first global standard on the ethics of AI, and it talked about human values, uh, respecting, protecting, and promoting human rights, and so forth. I think that's a really good place to start. I think the place we actually are has much more to do with surveillance capitalism. But I think we should want our AI to be based in human rights. Um, there's a wonderful document called the Blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights that came from the Biden White House that talks about safe and effective systems. We should all want that. We shouldn't want algorithmic discrimination and so forth. I think it's pretty obvious in some sense what we want, but what I would argue is that the AI that we have right now, and especially the AI that is popular right now, generative AI, is one that is technically and morally inadequate. And the first part of my talk will be to lay out some arguments for that and some reasons why I think that. But first of all, I'll just give a quick definition of, of generative AI. I assume probably everybody now has played with it. A few years ago, nobody knew what it is. Um, one example is that you can, I don't know where my pointer is, but on the left, you can <coughs> um, ask a machine to, for example, outline your own talk. I never actually do that, but I did it as an example today. It gives a generic version of Gary Marcus. Um, probably not as exciting as I hope that I will be, but it could be a start if someone wanted to impersonate me or write a term paper on me. Um, and on the right, I had uh, one of these systems draw a pretty interesting image. The AI that we're focused on, generative AI, it's important to realize it's just one possible approach. It's really fun to play with, it's really popular, but it also has a lot of problems. I like to call it rough draft AI. You can trust it to make a rough draft of anything, like a Gary Marcus talk, if you were so inclined. I'm not sure why you would want to do that. Um, or anything else that you might want to do, but you can't really trust it. It has a factuality problem. So for example, it's pretty rotten at physics when you get right down to it. If you ask it a question that it already has a lot of data on, it may be very good. But if you tweak that a little bit different than the ones that are in the database, you get weird things. Which way is more one kilogram of bricks or two gram kilograms of feathers? You get three well-formulated paragraphs, no grammatical errors. And people read these things, and they're like, OK, that's great. But if you read them carefully, they're not so great. One kilogram of bricks and two kilograms of feathers weigh the same? That doesn't make any sense at all. And by the end, it says in air, two kilograms of feathers would weigh slightly less than one kilogram um, of bricks. So we might say that it's factually challenged. Um, here's another example. Someone <coughs> sent this to me. They said, please write a one-paragraph biography of Gary Marcus. And it started off like some introductions for me. Gary Marcus is a distinguished cognitive scientist. Thank you very much. An author, blah, blah, blah. But then it goes on to say, notably, some of Marcus's more piquant observations about the nature of intelligence were inspired by, and some of them were inspired by my children, so you could have finished it that way. But instead, it said, by my pet chicken, Henrietta. I do not have a pet chicken, and I would not name it Henrietta if I did. It's just completely made up, and it's presented as absolute fact, as absolute truth. Um, there's a saying in the military, frequently wrong, never in doubt. And that's exactly what we've got here. So I gave this talk in, in um, Munich a couple months ago, and somebody finally explained why it is that it did this. Um, they went and they found a book called Henrietta Gets a Nest, and it was illustrated by Gary Oswald. I'm Gary Marcus. I don't illustrate books. I didn't write this one. But all that the language models do, large language models, 
is basically put together statistics, superficial statistics of the words and sometimes the images that they see. They may seem smart, but the truth is they can't sanity check their own work. They can't, for example, like a person, an intelligent person, could go to Wikipedia and say, is there anything about Gary Marcus and his pet chicken? Or go out to Google or whatever. These systems can't do that. They don't sanity check. What I heard for years is, yeah, Gary, you're very critical of these systems, but we're going to solve it by adding more data, and we're going to solve it by adding in pictures and so forth. And I said, well, let me see. Let's see, see how it goes. I don't think it's really going to work. I could go into technical reasons later why I didn't think it would work. But they finally did that, and we get crazy things, like what time is shown in this clock? And it says 10.07. Why does it do that? Because a lot of advertisements show 10.07 because the hands look really nice. So if you want to sell a fancy watch, then you put it at 10.07. It's, again, the statistics that are driving things, not real intelligence. Um, or here's another one. How many sides does this shape have? And it tells us there are eight sides and it's an octagon. These systems really can't count, and they're not really checking their facts. Um, I had a terrifying moment yesterday, I will tell you, because OpenAI was going to release a new model, and I had just written my talk. And I am so tired of rewriting my talks every time there's a new model. And so I was like, oh, what is OpenAI going to release? And as you may know, they released some, some popular, uh, exciting new stuff yesterday. But the same problems are still here. By the time I got home from dinner, my Twitter feed was filled with people tagging me with examples like this. Um, this is from OpenAI's brand new, you know, Ballyhood model that all the press is writing about this morning. Who was the first elephant to swim across the English Channel? Well, this is as bad as my pet chicken Henrietta example. The first elephant to swim across the English Channel was Jumbo. Sounds plausible, but it's of course garbage. An Indian elephant. Jumbo made the historic swim in 1959. Can you actually imagine an <coughs> elephant swimming across um, the Channel? This feat was part of a publicity stunt arranged by a circus owner. It all sounds very plausible. When I went on 60 Minutes last year, I called it all authoritative bullshit. This is more authoritative bullshit. Um, there's also toxicity problems with this system. I'm not even going to read these aloud. You can read them if, if you want. But even with so-called guardrails, it's very easy to get these systems to say things that are truly vile. Generative AI also has a bias problem. So you can type in something like leadership, and you might get a bunch of white males um, leading a bunch of white males. Um, or a paper that just came out last week showed that if you use these systems to evaluate job resumes, there's lots of discrimination. These things are actually arguably worse even than the history of discrimination in our society because they tend to perpetuate stereotypes from the data and they can't reason in the way that we can about what would be ethical to do now even if there was discrimination before. Generative AI also has a plagiarism uh, problem. So the New York Times noticed if you compare the left column and the right column, everything in red um, in the left column was said in an actual New York Times story. So these systems often just repeat verbatim things that they've seen before. They don't always do it, but they can do it. They're trained on a lot of copyrighted material, <coughs> and they're very prone to repeating it. I did some work with an artist, Reed Southen, who works with Marvell and places like that in January, and we showed that these systems also plagiarize in the image domain, and now we know it's true in the musical domain um, as well. So all of these things came out of mid-journey. They're obviously repeating, spitting back things that they've seen in copyrighted materials, and you can even get these things without asking for them. So it might not be a surprise if I said, draw me some Simpsons characters. But you can say things like, draw an Italian plumber. You don't name who you want, and you get Mario. A real artist would be embarrassed to give a copyright or trademarked Nintendo character. But there is no embarrassment or no shame either in these systems or the people that are making them. Um, generative AI also has a personality problem. Someone actually kind of took seriously, what if it were a person? Of course it's not, and we tend to anthropomorphize them, to anthropomorphize them too much, but for the sake of argument, if, if you did a psychological analysis, you would find <coughs> that GPT models <coughs> are not a picture of good mental health, that they would exhibit uh, low self-esteem. Think about all the apologizing they do. You probably experienced that. They have a disconnection from reality. I've already shown you that. And in fact, they sh uh, display severe psychopathy. Like the New York City um, uh, assistant on, that somebody asked about schools, or sorry, it was the meta AI. Somebody asked about schools, and the meta AI referred to the experience of its children. Well, only a so so sociopath tells you about the experience of their children in a school if they don't actually have children. So these, these systems are not really what we want. 
Um, I don't have time to go into all of the immediate risks, uh, but this is from my forthcoming book, Taming Silicon Valley, and I go through a dozen different immediate risks. The one I'm most worried about is disinformation. We have 70 elections around the world. Um, the election here in Slovakia was at least influenced by uh, misinformation at the last minute. This is going to, or deliberate disinformation, deep fakes, um, text that is generated automatically by these machines. Even though these machines aren't that very, aren't very smart, they can easily mimic human styles, and because they can't fact check, that makes them kind of perfect tools for disinformation. And so there is a real chance that one or more democracies will be disrupted um, this year. That's my biggest concern, but there are many others. There's market manipulation, there's accidental misinformation, um, <clears throat> there's all these fake books and stuff like that now, um, there's defamation, it's happened a bunch of times, there's non-conceptual deep fake porn, there's accelerating crime, cybersecurity we touched on earlier, today, there's bias and discrimination, there's privacy and data leaks, there's um, stealing intellectual property, um, there's also the problem that people over rely on unreliable systems because they hear that these systems are great when they're not, and they're huge envi environmental costs. And that's just now, um, there may be serious long-term risks. I'm not convinced that AI would ever extinguish the species like some people do. Um, a bunch of uh, famous CEOs said mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority along with other societal uh, risks such as societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. I think that's a little bit too strong, but I do think that we could have real catastrophe from AI and that we should be worried. <coughs> I drew this little kind of handy reminder, you are here, we already have a lot of AI risks. Whether or not we get to anything that's genuinely existential or if AGI poses new risks, we already have enough to worry about with the AI that we have right now uh, with generative AI. My view is that generative AI has not proven itself to be a net positive for society. There's some arguments maybe that it, it's produced some positives, for example, has computer programmers program faster, but there are also some uh, pretty serious risks. I would not want all the computer programmers in the world to program faster if we were gonna lose some democracies. So that kind of brings me to policy and politics. Almost exactly a year ago, a year ago tomorrow, I spoke in the US Senate next to Sam Altman, and I made a bunch of recommendations for policy there, and I've made a few elsewhere. I won't go through all of them in detail, but I'll give you the gist. Um, the most important thing is there, because there are many risks, we shouldn't expect <coughs> a silver bullet here. We shouldn't expect any single law is really gonna handle all of this. We need to look at each of the risks. Generative AI is almost like a hydra. New risks show up every day. Um, we shouldn't expect any silver bullet here. And we should also realize that existing laws were written long before large language models. So for example, our defamation laws kind of care about intent. These systems can defame people without any intent at all. That doesn't mean that we should um, exonerate them. <coughs> a secondary point is that agility is key. As these models change, we may need to change the laws relatively quickly, which means that, for example, the US Senate's not the ideal system for handling these things. Okay, there are a bunch of other things we need. We need transparency. We want a full accounting of what data is used to train the models <coughs> because the biases in these models come from how they're trained. And also because if we want to do the scientific work of mitigating the risks, we have to know what data goes into the systems. They're all black boxes, which means we don't really fully understand them. But if we don't understand the data in, we have no idea how they get to the data out and, and it's hard to do anything about them. So we need transparency in a number of ways. I think if we're gonna deploy something to 100 million people, we should do something like what the US FDA does, which is they say, tell us what the benefits are of your medication and what are the risks and why is this worth it? <coughs> we also need to look at systems after the fact. We have to audit them and say, how is this working out? And we have to make the job of the scientists to do that easy. We have to force the companies to give us the data that we need. So for example, are these systems discriminating against people in employment? Well, we need to look at how the systems are being used. The companies don't want to share that, but we have to make them do that. We need to have liability laws. So in the United States, we have something called Section 230 that allows the social media companies to basically publish anything they want without liability, even if they hype things that are misinformation because that gets them more clicks. We can't do the same thing in AI. 
we need layered oversight. So you can think about the airlines and how we make them so how we make commercial airlines so astonishingly safe. Well, that's because we have rules about how you can design a plane, how you can manufacture a plane, how you can maintain a plane. We have systems for investigating accidents and so forth. We should think about a AI like we think about aviation. There's a lot potentially at stake. We need to have layered oversight. And scientists absolutely have to be in the loop, and I'll come back to that a little bit. We also need national and global AI agencies. So I can't go into all of these right now, but it gives you the gist of what we might need. The good news is that many senators from both parties were supportive of many of these things. I was astonished that people like Hawley, who we all know from the fist bump at the insurrection, were with me on what we needed uh, in order to handle AI. But the bad news is so far in a year, not one of these kinds of ideas has actually been put to a vote in the United States. So EU has made real progress in regulating AI. The United States has not. And so that brings me to money and context. You know, most of my career I worked on research, I built AI companies. I didn't really think about politics that much and I got very much immersed in it in the last year. The first thing we have to do is we have to recognize that the interest of technologies Technologists do not necessarily align with the interests of humanity. So there was this cartoon in, in The Economist just after the big U, UK AI summit. And on the top, you have the different countries, but it might as well be the different companies, saying, we declare that AI poses a potentially catastrophic risk to humankind, which I showed the letter where they actually said that. <coughs> and then they say, and I cannot wait to develop it first. So they're all talking about how terrified they are, and none of them are slowing down. We also shouldn't let big comp tech companies decide everything for humanity. So a good example of this, a very hard question, is should we open source AI? Nobody's really quite doing that now. They're open sourcing the weights of the model and not the actual source code. That will mean something to, to some of you. But in any case, <coughs> some people like Jan LeCun at Meta think this is a fabulous idea. We'll move faster if everything is open. And others like Jeff Hinton are saying, hold on, maybe that'll make it easier for bad actors to cr produce bioweapons, for example. I won't pretend to know the answer to that one. I think it's one of the hardest questions that I think about a lot. But <coughs> what I do know is it shouldn't be up to Mark Zuckerberg to decide. But what's actually happening is exactly that. Jan LeCun, who works for Mark Zuckerberg, and Zuckerberg sat around, they talked about it, and I love the wording here. The meta leadership was convinced that the benefits of open release of Llama 2 would overwhelmingly outweigh the risk and transform the AI landscape for the better. That's what they decided, but the rest of us should have a vote on that. It's absolutely wrong to have what might become hereditary oligarchs, as the last talk uh, talked about, decide that for everybody. Once they make that decision, we all are forced to go along. There is a huge gap between what big tech companies say about responsible AI and what they actually do. So for context, last week there was a, a news item that they had given $2 million to warn people of the potential harms of deep fakes, that OpenAI and Microsoft had uh, decided to do that together. So for context, I just compare that to their valuation. So the collective valuation of them is $3.1 trillion, and they gave $2 million. So we should all give them a very slow clap for that. And then the amount that most individual artists have received for the work they've been trained on, or the wor their work that has been trained in these systems, is zero. And speaking of zero, there's been zero disclosure of what copyrighted materials have actually been used to train these systems. It's all just seized. <coughs> Sometimes truth is darker than fiction. I think uh, this is actually 2012. It's a typo here. Um, probably many of you, because of your interest in climate change, have seen this cartoon before, but it applies not only to climate change, but possibly to AI, or at least there's a potential. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. So that's a very depressing cartoon. What's really creepy to me is that Sam Altman, three years later, 2012, 2015, actually said almost exactly the same thing, except he wasn't kidding. He said, AI will most likely lead to the end of the world. This is the man who runs open AI, but in the meantime, there will be lots of great companies created. This is not a lot of solace, I think. Um, alas, we shouldn't trust Washington either. Some of you will know the term regulatory capture. And what that means, basically, is that big companies write the rules. 
Maybe the worst thing would be no regulation, but the second worst thing would be regulatory capture where the companies write the rules. That's where we're headed, at least in the United States. So for example, there was a meeting that Chuck Schumer, who's the Senate Majority Leader held, and somebody gave a list of them, I won't list it here, but it was all the CEOs of the big companies basically who were invited. And Marietta Schaka, who used to be a representative in, in the, the EU Parliament, wrote about it this way, and this was in September. She said, imagine convening a, about the question of how to legislate for CO2 reductions with the CEOs of Chevron, Aramco, Shell, Exxon, BMW, Ford, Tata, BP, oh, and a Greenpeace activist. Well, that would be regulatory capture and that's what happened. And okay, that was August, maybe they learned their lesson after all of us complained, well, no. Um, the Department of Homeland Security just released a new board on safety and security, and who did they put? They put the CEOs of OpenAI, Anthropic, Google, Microsoft, NVIDIA, and so forth. Um, and as Bill just said, uh, that sure does look like regulatory capture to me. We really have to worry about that, especially in the United States where there's a um, decision called Citizens United, a Supreme Court decision that allows essentially unlimited amounts of money from the corporation to flow to the senators. So the only way we're going to get to good AI policy in the US is if people organize and demand it. That's why I wrote my book, Taming Silicon Valley, is to try to get people to realize how much is at stake here. And I think in this respect with AI, we face exactly the same challenges we were talking about yesterday about apathy and so forth that climate change faced for a long time. We need to move uh, fast and we should learn um, from that situation. Okay, third part, as we develop AI policy, we need to be realistic about the limits of current AI. Being realistic means we have to know what's actually going on, and sometimes I feel like the people making the rules are seduced by the companies. So for example, the chip war on now, US is withholding chips from China. A lot is at stake, this could lead to military conflict, it's changing China's policy, and it's all predicated basically on the idea that if China got GPT-5 first, it would be a really big deal. My view is, what would they do with it? Write more boilerplate rough draft text faster than we can if they had GPT-5? This is not worth going to war over. Um, <coughs> it's also, as I'm going to talk about, maybe going to take longer than we thought. So, Building a foreign policy or building our AI policy around fantasies is not a good idea, but what Silicon Valley has learned is if they hype stuff, the stock goes up. And they've learned this over and over and over. So Elon Musk, for example, keeps playing the hype card with uh, driverless cars. Um, it actually goes back to, to Google even earlier, but Musk has said at one point that we'd have driverless uh, Teslas that would drive from LA to New York City by 2017. It's 2024, it still hasn't happened. He promised a fleet of a million robo-taxis by 2020, it hasn't happened. He promised that we would mass produce them, or he would mass produce them by 2024, it hasn't happened, but it always drives the stock price up. And so we get a, a misleading representation of what's actually possible. Similar example is, you probably know Sam Altman was fired and everybody started talking about this algorithm Q as if like Ilya Sutskever had seen it and it was going to change the world. I don't think that's actually gone anywhere yet. Um, in the reality, driverless cars are hard. For example, the company Cruise had more people in teleoperation centers than they had actual cars on the road, which should remind you of the Wizard of Oz, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Um, and it might remind you of some other stories where people tried to fake it till they make it and, and maybe never got there. Um, here's that thing I mentioned, Q. In the new OpenAI model yesterday, six months later, sorry, QSTAR, they didn't even mention QSTAR. Like it was a big hyped up thing and it just seemed to have disappeared. In reality, I think we've reached a point of diminishing returns for the current paradigm. Large language models, as I said, are really fun to play with. But there are these myths going around that they're getting better every few months. So Ethan Mollick has a book on the bestseller list. He claimed that the current best estimates of the rate of improvement in large language models show capabilities doubling every four, five to 14 months. It turns out he misread the study that he was citing there. But also, more deep than that, it actually looks like things are slowing down. So if you look at the graph, I tried to plot back to GPT-2, GPT-3, 
4 and the one that came out most recently until yesterday, GPT Turbo. So everybody's talking about an exponential curve. And that would mean that the trend that we were seeing on the left part of the graph would continue, that things are just doubling and doubling and doubling. But they're not anymore. They haven't been doubling for the last 14 months. So a big part of the hype is this idea that if we just keep doing what we're doing, if we just put in more data, and if you give us $7 trillion, then we will magically create artificial general intelligence. But if you actually look at the data, things have slowed down. This is from yesterday's paper that just came out from OpenAI. And only if you're in the first row will you be able to see the difference between GPT-4.0, which came out yesterday, and GPT-4 Turbo that came out a month or two ago. Only if you're in the first row because the difference is so small. We are not really in a regime of exponential um, improvement anymore. More likely, we're in a regime of diminishing returns. And that's probably because for a while, you get more and more <coughs> high quality data by harnessing the internet. But now, all of these companies are basically using all of the internet internet. They're doing all kinds of dubious things to get every last morsel of data, and they just don't have that much interesting data left. They're talking about things like synthesizing data. Well, I heard that with driverless cars for years. It still hasn't made driverless cars that we can trust. Um, so it could actually be that even though OpenAI looks you know, in invincible right now that they aren't really, um, it's worth remembering Apple was last to smartphones, but they had Tony. Google was later in the um, search engine space. I wouldn't assume either that OpenAI is going to win this race or that large language models are going to win this race. So the last thing I want to say is I think better AI is actually possible. Um, you know, I'm often viewed as a skeptic of AI. I am skeptical of things that aren't true. First and foremost, I'm a scientist. I spent a quarter century being a scientist before I moved full time into AI. I always look, is this thing, is it actually going to work? Um, but I actually want AI to succeed. That's why I built a couple AI companies. That's why I've studied it since I was eight years old. To get there, I think we're going to need to take some clues, though, from the human mind. We have a field right now where people that are good at a particular kind of math, matrix math, have dominated and kind of ignored everything else. And there's a wonderful quote from um, uh, Brian Scholl and Chaz Firestone. Uh, the human mind is not one thing but many. One of the things we have to realize is we do a lot of different things. And the AI we have now is good for some of them, but not all of them. It's not a well-rounded uh, cognitive system. Most of you will know Daniel Kahneman, the late Daniel Kahneman's Two Systems of Cognition. He talked about system one that was reflexive, intu intuitive, data-driven, and so forth, and system two, which is deliberative and reasoning-based and so forth. I imagine most of you are familiar with that. That's in humans. In AI, we have analogs to those systems. So generative AI comes pretty close to Daniel Kahneman's system one. It sucks down a lot of data, and it forms something that's like intuition. It's not exactly human intuition, but it's a good counterpart to that. And then we have classic symbolic AI. Um, and the <coughs> earlier talk alluded to this a little bit. It looks a lot more like computer programming and is more deliberative and reasoning based and grows out of a tradition of formal logic. So they actually each have their strengths and weaknesses. Generative AI is really good at learning. It's pretty poor at reasoning. You can't really count on it. Um, it's data hungry. It needs you know, the entire internet. It's uninterpretable, which is to say it's a black box. We don't know what it does. It's prone to hallucinations. I gave you a bunch of examples. Those are all negative. On the positive side, it's scalable. You can just make it better and better to some point. Maybe we've reached the point of diminishing returns for a long time just by adding more data without doing a lot of hard work. Um, and that's very appealing. Uh, and then it's grounded in the use of language rather than reality, which I think is problematic. Classical AI is almost the opposite. It's good at reasoning and not very good at learning. Nobody's really been able to learn the rules that classical AI depends on at any kind of scale. There's some toy models, but nobody can really do it well. It's data efficient on at least some kinds of tasks. Um, maybe not all. Maybe that was too charitable, actually. Um, it's interpretable. You can understand uh, what it is doing. It doesn't hallucinate in the same way. It doesn't just like make up things. Like if it consults a database, it just returns what's in the database. It's not going to tell you that Gary Marcus has a pet chicken named Henrietta ever. Um, imagine if you had a new database system, you know, a replacement for SQL, and it made a mistake. I don't know, one in ten times, like a large language model, is people would laugh in his face. It would never get any commercial traction whatsoever. Um, on the other hand, it's all handcrafted or mostly handcrafted, and that's a pain. And on the positive side, it's grounded in facts. They're almost complementary. But neither approach has ever worked on its own. And this should be just 
blindingly obvious to anybody who works in the field. Um, people used to complain that symbolic AI was brittle. You would give it a slight variation on a question and it would break. That's true of the new neural network approach, the generative AI approach um, on the left. We just don't really know how to make large scale AI. We don't know how to make driverless cars that work. We don't know how to make systems that really read with comprehension. There are things we can do, like we can make navigation systems work uh, pretty well and so forth. But <laughs> AI is basically an unsolved problem, no matter you know, what the Sam Altmans of the world might want you to think. All right, so here's the trick. The human combines both. That's what Daniel Kahneman's famous book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, was about. We use both systems. We don't always use them perfectly, but we do balance those two systems. It's kind of a checks and balance that allows us to get through life reasonably well. I will say I wrote a book called Kluge, which is about all the times it fails. We're not perfect. We're kind of a low bar, but could do better. But we do combine both, and that allows us to get along in the world to solve new problems we haven't seen before. AI has been trying for a long time to make do with one or the other with poor results. And that's a fact about sociology and money. There have been two traditions for 50-some, 60-some years, and people in the academy, what they do is they fight over money and graduate students and prestige. And these two fields have been fighting for all of those things for so long they've forgotten that maybe that's not the right thing to do. So if we can figure out how to build an AI that combines the best of both worlds, we can create an AI that's learnable, data efficient, interpretable, reliable, verifiable, and grounded in facts, and one that's capable of reasoning about human values, like don't discriminate against people or don't harm people, which current AI just can't do. A few companies, and this goes back to the last talk in an important way, a few companies own System 1. Like they own the technology and the, the um, GPUs to run it and so forth. But it's not too late to develop a new approach to AI that can be a public good working in the public interest. That brings me to one last suggestion and, I want, and then one more slide after that. So what I still think we need, and I suggested this first in 2017, a number of people have suggested it, but there has not been motion, is something like a CERN for AI, where we have a global project where people work together to make a public good, a form of AI that everybody can use, that perhaps combines the two systems as I described, that is not driven by commercial imperatives like let's get all the data and surveil people, but instead is motivated by trying to make AI that is good for medicine, that is good for neuroscience, and so forth. Um, the last thing I will say is I was really struck listening to the talks yesterday. And maybe some of you who have thought about climate change can help me in my mission. My mission is to try to tame Silicon Valley. This is a book coming out in September. The point is to try to ensure that AI works for all of us to get the general public involved. And what I noticed yesterday sitting here is that the issues with AI parallel those with climate change to an incredible and maybe somewhat depressing degree. Um, in both cases, we need to act with urgency. With climate change, we can actually plot how long we have. With AI, we can't because we don't really know how fast we're going to get to more dangerous forms of AI. We don't know how fast democracy is going to be undermined. We don't have the same kind of mathematical models, but we obviously don't have a lot of time. In both cases, there's a limited time window for action. You know, it's also the case that even if we figured out what to do 10 years from now, that might be too late. We can't, in either case, count on the government to do the right thing because of all the um, exigencies of money and so forth, unless people speak up and say, these things matter to us. AI policy matters. I wrote this book in a frenzy to get it out in September for, before the election because I want people in the US to talk about it and realize how important it is. And so another thing that's really important in both cases is that, gra is that grassroots action is essential. If anybody wants to come teach me about grassroots action, I'm very much all ears right now. And the last thing I will say is simply this. The choices that we make now about AI will have lasting effects, possibly for decades, even for centuries. We've got to get this right now and build an AI that works for us. Thank you very much.